This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to Cardiovascular Grand Rounds. This morning we have uh, Dr. Tanvir Rab, who all of you know is our speaker. Tanvir is associate professor in the Division of Cardiology and is one of our, our member of our interventional team. Uh, uh, Tanvir has a has uh, had a growing interest in and involvement in the American College of Cardiology, and as part of those interests, has, uh, as you can see from the title, has become very involved in some of the position papers and discussions around uh, how to treat patients with cardiogenic shock and high-risk PCI. And today, he's going to share with us, as you can see, mechanical cir circulatory support for patients with cardiogenic shock. Thank you. And cardiac arrest and high-risk PCI, <laughs> all in one breath. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. So um, the the title is as Bob stated. I've got no disclosures. Uh, the bad news is that people are dying from cardiogenic shock is worse than before. And uh, the mortality from, you know, 2005 to 2014 had actually increased from 27.6% to 30.6%. And why is that the case while well, we're getting so technologically advanced in this country that people are still dying from, from shock and arrest? And, the, and uh, so uh, Dr. King asked me to review this paper, and I did this editorial for Jack Intervention. And what we figured out was that uh, there was lack of use of early mechanical circulatory support. People were still using balloon pump, and, and the revascularization was incomplete. So around the same time, you know, th we started in this country having a lot of sites doing, uh, uh, did, uh, uh, doing PCI without bypass support, and it was thought that these patients were going there were doing poorly, but that was not the case. Uh, those patients were actually doing well, and patients that were high risk were actually being transferred more to tertiary care center, where the tertiary care centers themselves are not doing well, despite availability of these devices. So this led us in the council to do a sort of peer review of, of the problem, and we felt that, gee, these devices are available, but we don't have real guidelines and uh, how to, how to, uh, how to, uh, how to use it and when to use it and when, which patients to put it in. And the, the papers that came out in Jack Intervention as well as the Sky Position paper that talked about all this but never said, well, this is where you should use these devices and, and when you should be placing them. And, and uh, Dr. King thought this would be great interest to try to devise some kind of algorithm based on uh, what the council's experience was. And we got two uh, big name players, Dr. Oman and Dr. O'Neill, who had uh, many, many years of interest in this field uh, to help us write this document. So. What is cardiogenic shock? This is the uh, definition from Dr. Hockman from the shock trial, uh, which says systolic blood pressure less than 90, lasting for 30 minutes. Supportive measures including fluids or pressors to maintain a blood pressure greater than 90. End organ hyperperfusion with cool extremities. A poor urinary output less than 30 mils per hour. Heart rate over 60. And hemodynamic criteria with cardiac index of, uh, of less than 2.2 and a wedge greater than 15. However, you know, as you know, this will require the placement of a PA catheter. We decided to go a little further and decide to define it in this paper as pre-early shock, shock, and severe shock as salvage shock. And pre-early shock was uh, somebody who started blood pressure less than 100, not particularly really tachycardic with normal lactate, normal mentation, but having cool extremities. Index would be in the 2 to 2.2 range. Wedge was, would still be less than 20. And active medication would be none to one low dose, low dose, for example, epi or dopamine. True shock, again, with the definition systolic less than 90, heart rate above 100, lactate level rising, mental status changes, cool extremities, index between 1.5 and 2, bed pressure rising greater than 20, and LVDP following that to above 20, and using one or more high dose uh, pressor drugs. And severe shock, uh, of course, or salvage shock, historic blood pressure less than 90, the patient's tachycardic, lactate is rising to over 4, he's obtunded, index is low at 1.5, and wedge pressure and EDP are both rising above above 30, and there are more than two or three presses involved. So, uh, so where do we use these, we'll define later in the algorithm. So what are the causes of shock predominantly less left ventricle failure when they come to our uh, cath lab, 75% of the time? RV shock from RV infarct is low. Mechanical complications is next big at 8.3%, followed by VSD and frank tamponade ruptures is very low, but the predominant is LV failure. And in time course event, it's generally about six hours from the onset of symptoms to develop in a shock, predominantly in the LAD territory distribution infarction, but also in vein grafts that supply a large territory. 
So you know the pathophysiology to go through this very quickly. Your critical mask of LV necrosis leading to fall in uh, stroke volume cardiac output. Myocardial perfusion is then compromised leading to tachycardia and hypotension. Increased filling pressure for ventricular dilatation reduces further perfusion as well as causing wall stress which increases oxygen demand. And then there's generalized metabolic dysfunction with lactic acidosis reduces your cardiac performance. The pressure volume loop is very important to understand because, and I'll go through that in just a minute, and how these devices work. So if you know, if you remember the pressure volume loop from physiology, your mitral valve opens and the aortic valve closes at a time of isovolemic relaxation of the ventricle fills. And then the aortic valve opens and mitral valve closes, and then there's isovolemic contraction to eject the blood out. This area, this curve is stroke volume of the actual work of the heart that we should keep an eye on. EA arterial elastance is a component of afterload, and Emax is, is, reflects your contract, slope of your contractility. So, in myocardial infarction, you have a decreased stroke volume, ventricular contractility decreases, and your filling pressure increases. And now, cardiogenic shock, a more extreme of that, uh, severe depressed uh, stroke volume, and a drop in blood pressure. You have the marked impairment of contractility, uh, of the left ventricle and elevation of both EDP and left ventricular volumes. So, uh, how do these devices work? And the balloon pump, uh, uh, you know, augments diastolic filling. And when it does that, it increases myocardial perfusion, but also increases the work of the heart. The heart's work actually increases rather than decreases by the use of balloon pump. And the blood pressure does increase with that. But the work of the heart, and that's important to remember, increases with the balloon pump. Uh, left ventricular assist devices like Impella actually reduce LV pressures, go the other way, LV pressures and volume, and they reduce the cardiac workload as well as the work of the heart. The heart is rested. Unlike the balloon pump, the heart is rested here. The ECMO device actually adds volume to the circulation, and by doing that, increases afterload, increases pressure. But, uh, but by, by increasing the LV systolic and diastolic pressure, the sheer return of that volume, it, uh, it, uh, it it reduces stroke volume, but the work of the heart actually, if you look at this, actually increases some. So the heart is not quite rested, the afterload is increased, and you actually require venting by the balloon pump or impeller to help the heart be more efficient. So these are how the mechanical circuitry support devices work. So the, so the ideal MCS device to, uh, gives you circuitry support, systemic perfusion, maintaining mean pressure, it gives you ventricular support with LV, RV, and loading, and trying to reduce the LV, then systolic and diastolic pressures. And of course, you need to maintain your coronary perfusion. So devices that are, that are available are, are the pulse style device that really depend on your rhythm as well, such as the balloon pump. You have to have a cardiac rhythm to ma maintain function of the balloon pump. The uh, axial flow devices, such as the impeller that we use over here, and the one that's experimental, the percutaneous heart pump by St. Jude's, and the centrifugal flow devices known as tandem heart or the VIA ECMO. The PHP is device investigational. So, uh, so the cardiac flow, I'll come to that in just, uh, just a minute. The least is the balloon pump. The impeller, depending on size, can give you larger flows. Tandem heart between 2.5 to 5, and ECMO between 3 to 7 liters. Uh, implant with the balloon can be weeks, but for the larger devices, that's such as the impeller, should be between 7 days uh, minimum, really. Uh, 14 days a bit much, and weeks with the ECMO is possible. Sheet sizes are larger with the uh, impeller, 13 to 14 French. Uh, tandem heart, 15, 17 French, and ECMO, about the same size range. And the femoral artery has to be more than 5.5 to 8 millimeters to accommodate the larger board devices. Cardiac synchrony is needed for the balloon pump, not for the other devices. Uh, cardiac power output actually increases with these other devices. A coronary perfusion actually increases the impeller and the balloon pump, but not with the other devices. Myocardial oxygen demand is generally decreased by all these devices. And in terms of flow, flow rates of the MCS devices, the balloon pump is low. Impeller 2.5 is about 2 to 2.5. Two and Impeller CP, which we use now, is more between 3 to 4 liters. Tandem heart between 3 to 4 liters. And VA ECMO is higher. 5 way Impeller, which has to be inserted surgically, can be about up to 5 liters or so. So the balloon pump works by diastolic augmentation of the coronary perfusion. And it improves myocardial perfusion because of the because when the balloon, when the balloon is inflated in diastole, the, the, the whatever sits in the aorta or so is, is retrograde perfused down the coronary artery. It improves myocardial perfusion, reduces oxygen demand, especially when autoregulation is exhausted. 
useful for a situation like, say, if you have left main stenosis, something, and you're in a cath lab, and it's critical, the patient may have low blood pressure, so putting balloon points is probably useful in that kind of situation. We're trying to tie the patient up for, for surgical pur purposes. Um, it's, it can be helpful to sustain hypertension, and, and just certainly it's, it's efficient in coronary uh, microvascular dilatation. And now, from the shock trial, uh, shock 2 trial, controls the patient who didn't get the balloon pump versus those who got the balloon pump, there's absolutely no difference in the outcomes, okay? And that, that really drew our attention to whether we should be placing devices in, in shock or not. And there are multiple studies, shock to tactics, uh, smaller groups from Washington Hospital Center, the British uh, Cardiovascular Society Registry. All of these studies show that, at, uh, that the survival rates were no difference between the balloon pump and not putting a balloon pump in. So there was no difference surviving patients see the balloon pump in AMI with cardiogenic shock. And that sort of makes sense because even if you put a balloon pump in, as I went through the coronary physiology, you actually increase the work of the heart. Let's go to the impeller. And the impeller is a device that you put in, in the, it's got a pigtail at one end, and basically there's, there's a little motor unit here which drives blood from the ventricle out into the aorta. And it does increase the filling pressures, it increases aortic pressure and flow, and um, it also increases decreased oxygen demand and increases the cardiac power of the, of the ventricle. So if you go back to the pressure volume loop over here, as we described, the stroke volume is also the ventricular work. This area under the curve is the ventricular work of the heart. And, and the, uh, what the balloon pump does is actually uh, the, the increases stroke volume, uh, stroke volume that offsets the pressure reduction, but the impeller goes the other way, it reduces the, the amount of the pressure volume loop, it reduces the cardiac work. So the benefit of the impeller-like devices is by reducing the cardiac work compared to the balloon pump. So reduction in cardiac work results in reduction of myocardial oxygen demand. Now if you, um, say, have somebody with left main and, or high-grade stenosis vein graft, and you decide to, uh, to stand it to put a balloon across, you, you may have hypotension, Pretty, uh, pretty steeply. However, if you put a device like Impella in, uh, and you're able to maintain your pressures and be able to conduct your, your, your procedure satisfactorily. So no, no Impella, you can have a rapid decline in systolic blood pressure very, very quickly. And if you put it in, you may able be able to sustain your main pressures to be able to complete your high-risk PCR left main intervention. So trials of Impella and high-risk PCI, uh, the, the US Pella, Euro Pella, and protect one, protect two studies. The, if you use the devices prophylactically in high-risk PCI, so your survival rates can be good, above 80% in most cases. So what do the guidelines say? The guidelines do not, uh, uh, in 2001, PCI guidelines state that hemodynamic support device, it did not classify which one or the other was, uh, uh, was, a, was, a, was, a, was a class one indication. Uh, and it gave a class one indication in 2011 to the balloon pump and a class 2B to mechanical circuitry support devices. We didn't have all this data that we have currently using MCS versus balloon pump. In 2013, the STEMI guidelines gave a class 2A to the balloon pump and a class 2B to the, to, to the MCS devices for high-risk PCI. And in 2012, the STEMI guidelines, it gave a class 2B again to the balloon pump and class 2B to the, to the, um, to the MCS devices. In 2014, the European Society uh, of Cardiology said there was a class three indication you shouldn't use a balloon pump at all uh, in cardiogenic shock. And they gave uh, mechanical circuitry support device a class two B indication. Now, why do you say, why have they not come up to a class one indication? I think because a lot of these uh, studies uh, have been small, okay? They're not large randomized trials. And based on level of evidence B, you really could not uh, advance the MCS cost to a class one. Even, even in, in larger European trials. But the balloon pump certainly has got a, got a class three indication for shock now. You should not be using that in shock. Now, Impella has gone through an approval process in 2015, got approved for a high-risk PCI. In 2016, this year, got approval for shock. And uh, then it has the HDA uh, approval for right-sided Impella for people in right-sided heart failure or shock from right-sided causes, which approved this year. Other devices, uh, we don't have this device here. This requires transeptal puncture. This is known as the cardiac assist tendon heart. It access to LAY standard transeptal technique. Um, it's a uh, catheter exchange made with valve plastic guide wire and plastic wire. If you dilate the septum up to allow a, a, a large cannula to be placed, of course, it requires expertise in transeptal uh, puncture. The only institution in this country who really has done well with this is the Baylor Institute. Others have not had similar results. And one of the important things about this device is that it's, that it's a profound thrombocytopenia and hemolysis.
And this is what the device looks on, on x-ray. Results with this device, and this is most, uh, from both Europe and the Baylor group showed that putting this device compared to the balloon pump ha had, did increase your cardiac power and reduce your mortality. Finally, the ECMO, the VA ECMO, you have a, a large arterial cannula and the iliac artery with the VA ECMO and distal limb perfusion can be a problem. You have to do, uh, add other catheters to improve uh, retrograde flow. And uh, surgical, and generally they're large enough, they require surgical explantation to remove the device. And if you place a, a cannula pretty high up, there's a risk of drawing the blood away from the cerebral perfusion. You may have to put in additional catheters to shunt blood towards the brain. Um, the use of ECMO in this country has increased about 433%, but the mortality rate has not, has not, has not uh, improved. And particularly in ca acute cardiogenic shock, the role of ECMO is still questionable, whereas in cardiac arrest, uh, it, it appears to be better. Those patients who have been able to get to a center with, uh, with ECMO expertise, uh, they, they, they have a high survival rate. So average, if you have cardiogenic shock alone, you can possibly achieve a 60% survival rate with impella, tandem heart, or ECMO compared to the balloon pump. So um, I won't go through this in just a minute. So we came up with this algorithm, and I want to go through this. Um, so the algorithm brought in the three different kinds of shock we talked about. So there's a group under the cardiogenic shock, there's cardiac arrest, and high-risk PCI. So for cardiogenic shock, uh, the, for the pre-shock, early shock, we, and I'll come to this in, in a minute, we're still thinking about patients who have high-risk anatomy or, say, left main, or maybe slightly hypertensive or after your cardiac cath procedure. Uh, you may want to tie them over to get them to surgery with, with a balloon pump. And a lot of, uh, we got critique for this as to why we still include the balloon pump despite a class three indication. But I'll come to that in just a minute. And you can rapidly escalate if the patient's not doing well uh, to, uh, by reassessment of hemodynamics to an impeller. Of course, in severe shock with hypoxemia, um, uh, if, if there's no biventricular failure or RV failure, you do femoral angiogram and go to impeller or tandem heart. If there is biventricular failure, you can put a bipella, I'll talk to that in a minute, or tandem heart. Uh, and uh, if the patient's still shocky with biomedical failure, you can consider VA ECMO. And cardiac arrest, if there's no return of, uh, of spontaneous circulation, uh, uh, you, if, if there's return of spontaneous circulation, the patient is in any of these shock categories, you can again stratify them to probably an impella or tandem heart. If there's no return of spontaneous circulation, you think about a VA ECMO. High risk PCI with such an unprotected left main, last patent vessel, EF less than 35%, complex C vessel disease. Um, you may think about uh, stratifying your patient to, to, to femoral angiogram. At the, uh, the arch is less than more than five millimeters, no significant femoral tortuosity. We think about an impella. If all these are present, at least uh, we can try an axillary. And certainly in our center, we have placed transcable access for, for these kind of high risk procedures. So a poll was done in this country which support devices do the cath, do the cath labs have? And 9% of the, of the cardiologists answered they only have the balloon pump and Impella, 31% of cases, ECMO, and 22% of cases. So, so these devices are not available everywhere, and certainly in uh, large populations like China and even places, places in Europe, these devices like Impella or Tandem or ECMO are not easily available, except for a few centers. Um, and in China, some of the two large centers that I know of don't even have the Impella. They just have the balloon pump. And the reason why we left the balloon pump, the algorithm, was just this, because even though there's a class three recommendation in shock, this is the only device people have. So the, despite the criticism as to why we still get the balloon pump, the algorithm, that's the reason why we left it, because majority of people still had the balloon pump. These devices, the Impella, Tandem Heart, uh, ECMO, are very expensive to place and maintain. So uh, now what I want to do is to uh, talk about when to perform a right heart cath. Of course, right ventricular infarction, uh, lack of hemodynamic improvement despite revascularization and LV support, biventricular failure, and certainly an acute pulmonary embolism with shock. So um, the effectiveness of right heart catheterization in the initial care of critical ill patients through the support investigation was that it increased routine PA catheter, increased mortality, and increased utilization resources. This came out in JAMA in 1996. However, the cardiogenic shock group, uh, it was felt putting the gusto by the gusto investigator that they may still have a role in those patients who are not doing well after initial revascularization. So you bring the patient in, they're shocked. Uh, they, you, you put in a uh, support device or revascularize them emergently, they're still not doing well, they may have a role of having a PA catheter for the management. 
And in fact, right side involvement can occur up to 50% of shock patients from the shock trial and the shock registry. And RV failure is described as a CVP greater than 16, and an RA wedge pressure ratio of greater than 0 0.6. Now, the right side impeller nose impeller RP is now available. And in patients with biventricular failure, if you have the impeller uh, uh, CP alone, uh, your, your cardiac power output may not increase as, as, as you combine both the impeller and the right side impeller. You may actually, in case of biometrical failure, improve your cardiac power output. And this is what the bipeller looks like. Impeller on the left side, uh, right side impeller. This is what it looks like on x-ray. You've got your PA catheter sitting here. And that's what it looks like. Now, it's just been released in this country. Our experience in this has just been limited to about three cases. Uh, a couple of them were related to pulmonary embolism. In pure right sided shock, I think we just had one case only so far. So going back to the algorithm, let's illustrate where the algorithm could have been used. I'll just demonstrate four or five cases to you. Um, so this was a, a patient with left main stemic cardiogenic shock. It's age 75, 50 package smoker. A, comes in with the STEMI, systolic blood pressure 50 to 60 range. He's maintaining conversation with us. You can see the QR is widening as well as massive ST segment elevation, one AVL, V2 through V5. A chest pain, uh, chest pain onset occurred about uh, uh, 3.30 in the afternoon while playing with his grandkids, and he had indigestion-like pain, ignored it. He called the EMS about three hours later, uh, and then he arrived about 7 p.m., and by 7.30 in the cath lab, Systolic blood pressure was 50 uh, um, uh, minimum mercury. Uh, we placed a balloon pump. At that time, I would say this was four or five years ago. We we're not that fast out of the impella. The impella just come out to, to our market here. And we started with a balloon pump. And let's show his anatomy, his right coronary artery. Pretty unremarkable. And let's look at the left main, totally occluded. Uh, and you got the balloon pump sitting there. Uh, can somebody turn the lights down for the back? Can everybody see it? Or? Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah, thank you. So, let's see. So, of course, this was a, this is really shock, uh, severe shock. You put a balloon pump in. And uh, the most important thing is to wire very quickly and uh, re a balloon and stent very quickly, which we did. Our door to balloon time is actually 64 minutes in this case. Uh, and this is the result after the recanalization stenting. But you see the flow, there's virtually no, I mean, even if you have recanalized the vessel, you don't get that myocardial blush downstream. And that's a bad sign. It means that you've embolized stuff downstream and there's microvascular embolization. There's just no flow, no contractility over here. So the patient was still hypotensive. Should we give more pressors, add mechanical support, such as impella, tandem heart, or ECMO, emergent cabbage? Well, emergent cabbage probably not going to be helpful. You've already recanalized the culprit. We had the impella available, so we rapidly put in the impella. We, we, we went up on our algorithm, and because of severe shock, we decided to go ahead and put an impeller device in. Unfortunately, you notice that even with the impeller there and the balloon pump too, there's just no contractility, you know. And despite recanalization, uh, you know, the ventricle is shot. I mean, it's not going to recover. In fact, the patient went on to die. Uh, the next is, uh, is uh, another, another gentleman who's um, um, 50. And he's a diabetic with a 50 pack of smoker. He again presents with STEMI, stock blood pressure 80 to 90 range, recurrent VT requiring multiple shocks. His uh, CAT data shows that his EDP is 44, his PA pressure is elevated, 65 or 35. Syntax score is 36, and Euro score is 7. So that's a pretty high syntax score, syntax score being an angiographic score of the complexity of a coronary anatomy. And if you look at the global risk score, if your Euro score is more than six and your syntax is more than 33, your risk of any procedural outcomes is extremely, extremely high. So in this particular case, the patient has severe shock, uh, no doubt about it. You go straight with, to, to an impeller, which we did. The, the, this is the impeller device sitting here. The coronary anatomy showed uh, over here that the right coronary artery had, had a tight stenosis here. And uh, if you notice, there's also an aberrant LED coming off the top here, okay? That's an aberrant LED coming off the right over here. 
And in the other view, again, tight stenosis, right coronary artery, and again, if you notice, there's an aberrant LED coming off, off the top of the right coronary, right over here. So we intervened on the right coronary artery, we, we stented it, and then we proceeded to look at the left coronary artery. And the left coronary artery had this high-grade stenosis in the native distal left main, pro supplying predominantly the, the, what is the native left cirque, which is the LED was coming off the right. So we went ahead and, and, and treated that with uh, wires, balloons, stents, uh, and, uh, and the end result was, uh, was this. You see the large caliber of the circumflex system now, and that's what you see. So we revascularized this patient, and he did well. His EDP uh, the next few days really came down to 20. He was in heart failure that resolved, received an ICD. Seen as an outpatient, did well 30 days post-PCI. The next patient, 50-year-old male, presented the ED with chest pain. One sublingual nitroglycerin given and became hypotensive with altered mental status. You can see the hyperacute ST elevation in inferior leads. Uh, and uh, when he came up to the cath lab, I mean, uh, we first inserted a balloon pump. He remained hypotensive despite augmentation. His pressure really didn't, didn't increase very much despite epibolus's level fed in balloon pump. This was coronary anatomy, occluded right coronary artery. His LED was occluded, the left circumference occluded. So all vessels occluded except large ramus or diagonal branch. Again, the, in this view, the LED is occluded. This is probably high grade, uh, lesion high grade, uh, in the high grade region of the diagonal branch and circus occluded over here. So what we did was we added an impella. There's some data from, uh, uh, from Dr. O'Neill's group that if you add a balloon pump to the impella, your systolic blood pressure may actually increase, your cardiac index may actually increase as well, and your wedge would go down. So we decided to do both a combination balloon pump, which was then add the impella, so this is hardware, balloon pump, impella, temporary pacemaker, PA catheter. The systolic blood pressure improved in the 90s. He went to emergent cabbage. However, he was left with an EF less than 15%. He had frequent hospitalizations at a year for heart, for heart failure, but he received a heart transplant a year later and is doing very well. So he was in the mid-50s, he survived, his school teacher has gone back to work. So in this, this particular case, we started with the, with the shock, pre-shock, and escalated very rapidly to an impella, and that seemed to have helped. So the algorithm sort of walked its way over here as well. So hemodynamic support strategies are not competing, attacking both supply and coronary flow and demand, LV unloading is most important. So the impella unloads the LV, and balloon pump actually improves the flow into the coronary circulation. So uh, what about cardiac arrest? We published this paper last year, and again, uh, we had this algorithm in Jack uh, that was published in April last year. The most important thing is that you've got to look at the patient and look at multiple unfavorable resuscitation features. So unwitnessed arrest, initial rhythm being non-VF, no bystander CPR, greater than 30 minutes to return of spontaneous circulation, ongoing CPR, a pH less than 7.2, lactate more than 7, age greater than 85, end-stage renal disease, and uh, are all unfavorable features for patients going to the cath lab. And it's not just one feature, it's multiple features that have to be looked into when you look at the patient to see if this is a salvageable candidate for a PCI procedure. So outcomes of cardiac arrest and mechanical circulatory support is all related to ECMO. And you can have survival rates if you are in the right place at the right time and have easy access to, to ECMO, anywhere between 27 to 50 percent. And particularly if you're younger, you do better if you, if you get the ECMO in patient situation of cardiac arrest. So if we talk about a, a, a patient with cardiac arrest, abrupt occlusion cath lab, I've shown this patient before, presentation here. So this is a 75-year-old patient with a prior aortic valve replacement, one of Alan Dolan's patient, presenting with chest pain and non-STEMI. So you do the diagnostic cat, you see the left main is totally occluded, a very little, subtotally occluded, very little flow distally. And soon after this injection was taken, the, 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 there was no flow, and the patient arrested on the table. So but we had to do ongoing CPR. The most important thing is get your guide cat and wire in if you can, just balloon and stent it as rapidly as you can, because unless you improve perfusion, uh, trying to put in more devices this time is just not going to work. You just try to do things very, very rapidly, if you want to save the patient, you just go ahead and stand the left main as best as you can. So this is what we did. This is the end results here. And this is the final result. 
Uh, at this time, the pressure was restored, so we put a balloon pump in a temporary pacemaker. The patient survived the discharge three years later, neurologically intact, and aspirin crew with beta blockers. She's alive and well two, two years later. So what is high-risk PCI? Uh, this is LVF less than 35% with electrical instability, congestive heart failure. Comorbidities may include severe aortic stenosis, severe mitral irritation, COPD, chronic kidney disease, diabetes, prior stroke, peripheral vascular disease, age greater than 75, and acute coronary syndrome. And the coronary anatomy is what you look at, the last patent vessel, unprotected left main with a low EF, three vessel diseases, syntax greater than 33, and target vessel providing collateral territory with supplies more than 40% of myocardium, and a distal left main bifurcation. So this is a group that constitutes high-risk PCI. So let's talk about another case. He's 70, seen last year. Uh, he has two different cancers, multiple myeloma and lung cancer, ongoing at the same time. He also has bilateral deep vein thrombosis. He has the IVC filter and chronic warfarin therapy. And uh, he was diagnosed two weeks prior to presentation with, with the right hilar mass, and the biopsy had demonstrated a, a, a squamous cell carcinoma involving the right main stem bronchus. He walks, he presents to the ED two days in a row with three day history of chest pain. Um, creatinine is 1.2, his period count is satisfactory. His INR is somewhat low on warfarin, 1.92. So this is the, so the ED sent him back in two consecutive days. This was his initial ECG and presentation, but while he was act having active chest pain, he had ischemic ST7 depression, as you notice, with chest pain episode. So he was maintaining the ICU with, on, uh, on anticoagulants and nitrates, but he really couldn't get out of his bed without having chest pain or use the bedside commode without having chest pain. So he was brought to the cath lab. And this is his uh, anatomy. He's got a complex calcified distal left main stenosis over here. A chunk of calcium is sitting here, and he also has collaterals to the right coronary artery. His right coronary artery is totally occluded with his chronic total occlusion. So his uh, STS score was calculated. The table his mortality risk was 1.8 percent, morbidity and mortality 15.6 percent, risk of renal failure 3.2 percent. Calculated syntax score was low. We went over this many times over, uh, but the score was low in this particular case. So we brought this surgeon in to look at him on the table, and the surgical turndown was there because of two ongoing malignancies. But the oncologist stated that his uh, life expectancy was more than six months. So we decided to proceed with high-risk PCI with LV support from impeller device, primarily because he was having a lot of rest pain. And so in our algorithm, uh, we, we decided that he was a high-risk PCI with, unpro with unprotected left main uh, and, uh, and uh, and complex coronary artery disease, we were able to put an impeller in. Uh, his uh, femoral artery was calcified, we were able to put an, an impeller above that. And this is the cut chunk of calcium in the femoral artery right over here. So with impeller support um, and the temporary pacemaker because his right coronary is occluded, uh, went ahead and did a road ablation of the left main, followed by ballooning and this is a result after road ablation ballooning. This is followed by stents, and we actually did kissing stents left main and circ, and this is the final result. These results would not have been achievable without mechanical circuitry support. I've been able to do this, uh, these lesions, lesions patiently with a rotoblader and stenting. So now let's talk about alternate access sites. So we, we did the first alternate access site using the axillary impeller approach to do a complex PCI. And this is actually published in your intervention as a featured content from, from Atlanta. So this was a patient 68, 100-pack uh, year smoker, had both coronary artery disease and peripheral vascular disease, hyperlipidemia and hypertension. He's had two bypass procedures in 1987 and 2000. He has severe PVD, the state sport aorta bifem bypass in 82 and, and 1990 with a FEMFEM crossover in 1990-1994. Has had a TIA with left carotid endotrectomy in 2005, a DVT in 2010, chronic atrial fibrillation warfarin, severe COPD with the FEV1 of 0.75. The clinical presentation to, to one of my former partners in Athens was ACS non-STEMI. Initial troponin was 20, and the EF was 50% with mild anterior hypokinesia. Because of the complexity of his other medical issues, he was not felt to be a candidate for a third cabbage procedure. This is the anatomy. His only patent graph is a vein graph that supplies the right and collaterals to the left system. 
And this, these collaterals are primary to the uh, circ marginal system over here, as well as some to the LAD. Uh, and there's, a, there's got complex calcified left main disease, mid LED disease. The left main, mid LED. Again, left main, mid LED over here. Again, this to left main. And again, mid LED disease. So this patient high risk PCI um, uh, with, uh, with with large patent conduit with supplying collapse to the left side and complex left main disease. We could not do put an impella in femoral because he had a, a severe femoral disease and had actually had a previous fempop bypass and iliofemoral bypass. Uh, so we decided to uh, involve a, a surgical colleagues in this. The outcomes in this 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 group of patients putting an impella and doing high risk PCI. Survival is anywhere between 54 to 88 percent in the in the U.S. registries, but with the U.S. Pella registry, and the outcomes are improved if these devices are placed prophylactically early rather than late. So we took the patient to the OR, and we did the left axillary surgery, did the left axillary cut down, and uh, through that cut down, we attached eight millimeter gel V graft, and through the graft, we put the impella sheath in, and the impella catheter. Uh, goes through that sheet. And this is all done or 13 at that time. So this is the movie about the placement of the impella through this graft. That's my finger trying to help nudge the wire across the graft. And we call this an axillary chimney. And there goes the wire around the arch, around the supply into the arch. And then if you follow that, the multipurpose catheter with the wire into the ventricle. We always check the EDP before we put the impella in. The catheter is in the ventricle. We change out to the wire that comes with the impella kit. It's a supportive wire. And then we drive the impella down to the uh, graft into the ventricle. Okay, so... So then we proceeded with uh, placing guide actually to the right radial axis, no, sorry, uh, sorry um, right femoral axis, uh, um, and we were able to roll a blade the left main to the LAD. This followed by serial ballooning from mid LAD uh, to the mid LAD to the proximal LAD, and uh, two five by twenty balloons were used to dilate these lesions, followed by stenting of the of, from the mid LAD back to the left main. And then uh, these are the results following, uh, pre, those are pre-PCI results, left main, mid LED, and this is the, this is the post-PCI result. So the, the impeller cat was removed uh, in the OR, the gel weave graft was clipped and stapled into the anastomosis, the skin was sutured. Troponins 0.17 to 0.24, CKMB was 5 post-procedure. EF went up uh, in three months from 50 to 55%, and he was alive a year post-procedure. Finally, uh, you know, Vasilis has done a lot of transcale work and occasionally put an impella in, in to do a high-risk procedure. And this is done for patients small caliber SFA or severe iliofemoral disease. I uh, hope we can show this. This is the um, pigtail in the aorta, and this is the pigtail in the, in, the, in, the, in the vena cava to see which of the site where it can be best accessed. You do biplane views, AP and lateral. And this is the lateral view of the same. Again, pictal in the aorta. And basically, you try to define anatomy where you can puncture. Over here, you will notice that there's a snare in the aorta. And there is this, uh, this is a guide, the renal guide, where it takes a point .014 wire, which is attached to a bovie, and it actually burns that, that track into the aorta, and the snare captures it. So this is the AP view of this, and this is the lateral view of the same thing. And you have to have the catheter end fast looking through the snare. And once the wire is captured, it's driven up the order. And, uh, and uh, then you can put a stiffer wire to track up through the IVC, through the, through the aperture made in the order, up into the, um, 
uh, and to the ascending order is Journey 22 French Sheet over a dilator. Following which uh, you can deliver the impeller device. And this is what it looks like at the end. So I hope I have given you a overview of things that are possible uh, uh, in terms of mechanical circuitry support. The important message is to put these in early and our algorithm was just uh, to try to help uh, physicians and colleagues understand as to when and where to start and place, uh, place the devices in the most appropriate fashion. Thank you. Thanks, Tanvir. Um, start out with one question. I guess sort of what you brought us through is that one of the challenges of this area is the lack of sort of all the evidence-based medicine that we have for almost everything else in cardiology. A at the end, you indicated there's a registry. Could you tell us a little bit about sort of efforts to sort of gain that larger, larger uh, body of data that might help us? Uh, because right now, we're pretty much expert opinion guiding sure, us, right? Absolutely. So there are registries like the U.S. Bella registry that continues to collect data, and the registries that, uh, in Europe, and the ECMO registries. Certainly in cardiogenic shock and arrest, it's very difficult to do randomized trials of one device or the other, and the trial sizes have been very, very small and difficult to obtain. So I don't think we'll have standardized trials, but I think we have to go in this registry, which is about five years um, uh, uh, of age or plus, but really the U.S. Pillar registry. So we have to go on that data right now, Bob. We don't think we'll have randomized trials in, in this area. I don't think uh, we are over here. But the data is being collected of the devices that we put in. Pretty the Abumet collects our data. Uh, and uh, we have tried over the years, tried to get this data to, 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 get, to get our institutional outcomes uh, as to when we use devices, where we use it, and what the outcomes are. Now, there's a diff different population which we did not address, patients with chronic cardiomyopathies is a different, different uh, group altogether. And our impeller use has been varied over, over, over these different populations. I hope I answered your question. Any other questions? Just kind of following up on your comment, Bob, I think you've fabulous examples of what you can accomplish. I think the, the question is one case that didn't go well, and that's, that's the downside of this is, you know, how, particularly when you start saying, let's do this early, uh, you've got a very expensive thing. You had one person that had two malignancies, another person that had a cancer. That's not to say you shouldn't do them, but I think the difficult thing I find about cases like this is deciding who you do and who you don't do because it's such an expensive thing and, and you're putting them through a lot of effort. And clearly, there are very few hospitals in the country that can do this. I mean, and so then you're going to say, are you going to offer it and how are you going to get to mobilize these people to get them in? To I think uh, what is happening is that smaller centers are sending patients to tertiary care centers and nationally, and John Messenger, who's on the uh, CAT PCR registry, runs it, says, you know, tertiary care hospitals are being dumped by these patients from smaller hospitals, and they're having high mortality rate. The problem is this device, these devices are not being placed in early enough to improve survival. And that's why the whole national effort to try to remove cardiogenic shock and cardiac arrest for reporting purposes, just for very similar reasons. Now, the guy with the malignancy, Doug, was having rest angina. As an oncologist said, he had a six-month survival. And we talk about putting a device in that's $26,000 versus a $50,000 chemotherapy drug that he may just get once to extend his life by another three months. I mean, I think uh, that's, uh, that's not for us to judge, but I think uh, in this particular institution, he's, I was told he had six months to live, and he was having rest angina, just uh, despite maximal medical therapy, which included anticoagulants, beta blockers, nitrates, and manexa. He just couldn't get off the bed to his commode. So that's why we had to bring him up. And do well, that I'm, not, I'm not arguing that point, except when you say six months to live, that might not be six months strolling around and going to his favorite restaurants and, and going to the symphony and this type of thing. Actually, he's lived now to a year or so. <laughs> so uh, anyway. But no, I can't compliment you on your work. Now, the guy with the arrest who came, I think, once you have plaque rupture and distal embolization, as you know, no device is going to salvage you. I mean, I think that's what happened to the other guy who died, despite our best efforts. He had a door to balloon time of 64 minutes, but he was six hours late in total presentation. So, as you know, the extensive anti infarcts, if you're late in presentation, the chance of survival is very low, I mean, regardless, with a more than 60% chance of death. 
the uh, Dr. Guyton. Or Maybe until you get your... Uh, Good. So, um, you know, I mean, obviously, as you point out with this population, the, the, the challenges you bring up, the fact that uh, a lot of very thoughtful analysis can't be done really quickly, and very rapid decision-making has to be done. Um, the flip side of it is that, you know, even for small numbers of patients that you can favorably affect their outcomes, um, there's, there can be a significant mortality advantage. And so I think as, as a sort of as a community, we need to figure out how to address either clinical trials or, um, and I, 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 Neil Dickert has thought a lot about this. I see him in the back in terms of um, A, consenting these patients, organizing studies and, and, and coming together to answer questions. I, I, I do think the, the Impella story um, is compelling, but the, the, they really have to put resources behind a randomized clinical trial. Um, and, and frankly, um, you know, there hasn't been a push to do that. You know, they're, they're, because these registries have no control arms, it's, it's very challenging to uh, draw conclusions. I think the reality is we do that because we think it's going to help our patients, and it probably does. It does make a lot of sense. But I agree that there needs to be sort of a very careful value-based analysis, you know, because these are very expensive devices. Yes, so one thing that's happened is since the device was released for, for cardiogenic shock, um, the explosion of Impella use in this country has gone over 130%. And I'm told smaller hospitals are putting it in, and the criteria for usage is getting very, very shallow. So that's the other concern, that there's no control nationally about which we're very conservative in whom we put in, really think very hard because of the cost issue. And when we have to put in someone to put it in, we know that. But I think other cases like high-risk PC and others, we really think sort of very carefully, and people are not doing that. And Abiomed, other companies are pushing very hard for these devices uh, to be sold aggressively, and, and we know that. I mean, I mean yeah. and, and again, maybe Neil wants to comment on this. Uh, <laughs> but I think when you think about cost, it may be that for the hospital, it's not such a bad deal because the hospital gets reimbursed extremely well for these procedures. Um, and then there may be co-pays or no, lack of co-pays for patients. Um, but clearly on a societal level, it does explode the cost of sure. these patients. And, and I think that uh, really a, a careful conversation needs to be had. I would, I, would, I, would, I would encourage you when you give this talk to to give us a denominator. We need to know how many impellas were used in the last three years, what their survival is for high-risk PCI impella use, and what their survival is for cardiogenic shock impella use. Because anecdotal cases are, are great, and it was, you, know, you, need, you showed us one that died. The one that died is a, is a total left main occlusion, uh, and total left main occlusions don't survive unless you get them within the first two hours, get them revascularized within the first couple of hours. Uh, and we've learned that over and over again. Uh, but if, if, uh, uh, if we could try to get our denominators uh, in these... In these You're talking things. about this institution or just nationally? I think what you can get is this institution. Yeah. Because uh, we have the U.S. Bella Registry that, is, that, is there that gets this data set. Let me expand that question about uh, trials, and Neil's still here yet. Everybody's asking Neil questions. So, uh, if you were to design a trial to, to test uh, Impella in, in, uh, in these situations against balloon pump, I guess, um, and you mentioned informed consent, I mean, there's no possibility of informed consent. The question is, do you fake informed consent, or should this be a kind of study that would be like the heat trial where you have an institutional agreement that all these patients will be treated one way or the other, independent of any input from the patient, the family, or anybody else, given that, uh, is, is that a possibility that we can do heat trial type studies? Uh, so, so I think there's a lot of questions there. So the, the, the consent piece is interesting. Um, and in a sense, I think it's not a, it doesn't have to be a 
barrier as much as we just need to figure out the right way to do these. So I think there's multiple ways you can do trials like this. We're doing a study right now where we're talking to people who have been a part of acute MI and stroke trials. And what's interesting is people actually want to be, I think the HEAT trial, which was bivalerudin versus heparin in the UK, which was done without advanced uh, prospective consent, generated a lot of controversy. We're actually about to do a pretty large study looking at what the general public's view of that approach is. Um, patients who have been part of trials say they actually don't, Ken Habib was actually part of a, we, we did interviewed some folks as part of one of the STEMI trials he had done a while ago. What's interesting is people say they want to be told, they want to sort of say, um, are you okay with this? And that's about all they want to hear. They have no idea what they're consenting to, which many people would say that's a reason not to get consent. What patients say is that's a reason just to let them know ahead of time, um, which is actually interesting. I would have predicted nobody would ever want in the context of an acute MI to be involved with a discussion about being in a randomized trial. That's actually not what people are telling us. And so I think in some sense the process of involvement is probably more about sort of a demonstration of respect than any kind of substantive decision. So probably the, in terms of a, just concretely, the immediate trial which looked at, which a pre-hospital trial looking at glucose, insulin, potassium versus placebo in the ambulance had a, basically a two-line consent script um, that they did as an exception from informed consent trial. So they didn't call it consent. They just, the medics basically said, everyone is being enrolled in this trial. If you want to, if you want to not be in a study, you can say no. And they had, you know, eight, ten percent of people said no, and that's about it. Um, that's an approach probably that, re that I think is um, in some ways probably the best balance of the regulations and ethics in terms of how to move forward to give people a chance to say no but recognize that the consent decision they're making is entirely uninformed. Um, you know, I think the, the bigger question which you raise about sort of how to structure trials like this because it's, uh, you know, you have a lot of institutions which don't have a huge end but at the same time this is not an uncommon problem and a lot of people face it. There's lots of interest in exploring things like, um, so what Dr. King mentioned in terms of cluster randomization and other kinds of mechanisms where sites have an approach and you randomize by site rather than individual patients to make these things more, um, more doable is certainly a really attractive approach. And that's one where you can't get consent, right? You have to acknowledge you can't get consent if you're randomizing by site because you can't say, please turn me around and ship me to a different place. Um, so, so that's something that I think may have a role in this kind of thing. The other great example, I think, is the PRAMI trial, right? So PRAMI was looking at um, additional, so non-target vessel or non-culprit vessel revascularization, which is done as a registry-based trial. Um, and when you, have, when you have mechanisms like the uh, U.S. Pella registry and other kind of registry mechanisms in place to collect key outcomes, there is a possibility for very simple randomization or site-based allocation to different strategies. And the outcomes are already being collected. So that was an example of a study that was done on something like 1% of the budget of a traditional randomized trial. Um, so I, I do think there's a lot of interest in exploring mechanisms for doing studies in different ways that both reflect practice, so pragmatic trials, um, and utilize data collection mechanisms that didn't exist. Um, you don't get the kind of perfect data that you get in a newly set up RCT, but the outcomes we really care about for these kinds of things are hard endpoints like mortality, um, and, and you know, those are measurable in other ways. So I think there's, you know, people have to be creative. There has to be a lot of um, interest in this. There is a new network called SIREN that's um, replacing the Resuscitation Outcomes Consortium and the Neurologic Emergency Treatment Trials Group, which were NHLBI and NINDS funded networks for emergency trials, and SIREN is a sort of joint NHLBI and INDS venture, and you know, whether this would be something that a network like SIREN could potentially pick up would be interesting. Um, so, so a few thoughts, I guess. Okay, well with that, we'll uh, thank Tanvir again for a, a good talk, and thanks, uh, thanks for all the good comments. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.